Gentleman Style Podcast Show. And today we are going to talk about this gentleman that I'm bringing to the stage. He's an absolute, you all know, 300 is my absolute favorite movie rock star epic. And I feel honored to have a true Spartan, that's what I feel like, a true Spartan here on the show today. His story is actually impactful. He spent two months in and out of ICU, went into the hospital 195 pounds, strong, fit, and lean, and then five days later was fighting for his life. This man is an absolute beast, changing the game, changing everything, and he's inspiring millions. When I tell you millions, millions of Americans across the globe, everywhere, and inspiring and giving us hope that we can do better and live fulfilling lives. I sat in a hospital bed and I, I listened to a doctor and a nurse. They were arguing about whether to put me on a ventilator. So I started texting my wife, telling her how to run our life because I was like, I, I'm not going to make it. She texts me back. I can't do this life without you. And I went, you know what? I'm a savage motherfucker. to the stage, the incredible Mr. Trevor Beckmeyer. Woo! What's up, guys? Welcome. Welcome to the show, brother. You are a rock star, an absolute beast. Thanks. You're changing the world. I'm glad to have you here on the yeah. Gentleman Style Podcast Honored. show. Honored. We're going to knock it out of the park today, buddy. Absolutely. Something about you, when your story inspired me when i read your story and i listened to all some of your interviews yeah. i had to hit the gym <laughs> yeah good I had, to, I had to hit the gym because you talk about this and i and if you could share with my audience yeah. but you are a doctor mm -hmm. but you fought back you pushed back against the teachings your oath mm -hmm. and 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 fought for your life mm -hmm. against all odds and won Yep. Can you tell us what happened? How did you discover that you had cancer? Sure. What, what led up to that? Let me, I'll, I'll give you, let me back up. So there's a couple of, and understand that I, I think everybody's surrounded by miracles and, and just people are just so damn blind. They don't see them because they attributed them to, to something that they just, they want an explanation. That's not that. And yet they're the same people that go, I would never pray for an illness. I'll pray against an illness. Right. But they only believe when it suits them. And, and I think that's really screwy. So I, I, when I first met my wife, so 18 years we've been together. And shortly before I met my wife, and I'll keep this super short so you understand the background of why, why this matters. Uh, they diagnosed me with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, stage 3B. It was everywhere. And, and they were like, there's nothing we can do. Uh, my white blood cell count was off the charts, like so low. My red blood cell count, I couldn't even support chemotherapy. It was just one thing after the other. And I, I was making a ton of money. I had all this great success and, uh, and I blew well, over a million dollars in less than three months because I went, well, the hell with this, if I'm going to die, I'm going out with a bang. And I remember being in my apartment and I had nothing like I was broker than broke cause I'd blown it all. And I sat there and I looked out my patio window and, or my patio sliding doors. And I was mad at God. I hated God. I hated my parents. I was bitter at everybody because I thought like, why is, why do people get to live to be 80, 90, hundred years old who are just like shitbag human beings. And, and then there's people that like, I didn't do, I didn't drink. I didn't do drugs. I kept chicken and rice and broccoli in my fridge. Like I, and I cared about people and I'm going, why am I getting this? And I, I, later on, I started to realize that when you ask for an upgrade in your life, God goes, all right, here's the test. And you got to pass that test to get the upgrade. And that's where people screw up is they go, well, 
wait, 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 wait. I, I want the upgrade, but I don't want to do the work for it, which is a lot of the problem right now in the world is all this entitlement, right? So I sat there and I looked out of the wind, out of the sliding doors and I said, I'm done. I'm done. I, and I was, I thought God was trying to kill me. And I remember saying to, to my dad and, you know, he was a preacher. And I said, you know, God, God just, he hates me, man. Like he's out to get me. And my dad goes, that's, that's not how it works. Man. That's not, that's not how God works. And I go, bullshit. He, he, he's trying to get me. And so I refused to believe him. And, and I realize now that is not at all how he works. And I sat there and I pulled out my gun and I said, you better give me a reason to be here, God, because I'm not going to let you win. I thought killing me was letting him win, right? If he did that. And I said, you better give me a reason because I'm going to do it myself. I chambered around and I was going to end it. And I started bawling my eyes out and I fell asleep on the floor in my apartment on the carpet crying. And two days later, I met my wife, Brandy. And it's one of those things where you like I knew the second I saw her, I knew I knew right away. And I've had people go, how do you know you love somebody when you you don't even know them? I didn't need to. I've been in love with her my entire life. That's why I never worked out with anybody else. And it's not this cliche. The word cringe pisses me off because it's all these young idiots that have no concept about how to communicate. And I, I think to myself, you just know, you just know. And, and so I did. And I remember sitting across from her our very first date. And I said, oh, God, I got it in my head. I'm like, I have to tell this woman that they gave me less than nine months to live. I can't be that jerk that goes, okay, let's get involved. Let's create this great life. And then I die knowing full well that I had a problem. I can't do that. And, and I'm like, I got to tell her. I got to lie chance. to her. I can't, I couldn't do that. And, and I was like, cause it's such a shitty, selfish thing to do. And, and so I was like, God, you know, all right, I'll tell her. And I had to take the chance of her getting up and leaving. And I said, all right, listen, Brandy, I got to tell you something. And she's like, is it about cancer? And I went, yeah, it's wild. How did you know? And she says, well, the people at the gym, we all, we trained at the same gym. She was a trainer there. And she says, people have seen you in the, you know, in the lockers, like coughing up blood and really sick. And they say, oh. you're not doing so well. And I said, yeah, they didn't give me a lot of time. I said, less than a year. And I said, there's nothing they can do. That's what they told me. And at the time I kind of bought into their paradigm. Right. And, and she said, I don't care. She didn't miss a beat. It was seconds. She goes, I don't care. She goes, I'll take two years. I'll take two days. I'll take two months. She goes, stick I'll by you. All, I'll take all your time. She goes, I don't care. And I just, I started crying. So did she three months later, we were engaged three months after that we were married. And seven months after that, we had a daughter. And all of these things that they said would never occur. They said, I would never beat it. And I, I'm the guy that the more I do this, the more I realize you just keep telling me shit that I can't do. So I started looking at myself and I started going, you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm doing great. I'm killing it. Like I was just kind of a little bit like, yeah, this is all the life is good. I was jacked. I was fit. One night I woke up and I was starting to get sick. And one night I woke up and I said, Brandy, you, I think you got to take me to the hospital. And I never say that. Like there better be a bone sticking out of the skin for me to do that. Wow. I grew up on a farm, right? So it's like my dad would go rub some dirt on it, right? And and so, <laughs> right? Yeah, she takes me Wrap to the hospital. Up, put, take some time and I'll go back out there. That's it. So it was about midnight and my wife, uh, my wife, we get in the car. And it was about 15 miles to the hospital. And by the time we got there, I couldn't walk. I was 106 degrees. I was incoherent. They had to, she had to carry me into the hospital. Basically, if you've seen my wife, she's a damn beast. She is a yeah. savage human being. And I think, by the way, that is, sh I, I think, like I love me enough to take care of myself for her. And she does the same thing. I think it's weird when you go, oh, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to spend time with her. But you're sloppy in fact. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. Take care of yourself because you love her because she doesn't want to push you around in a wheelchair when you're 70 because you chose to have a, a weak life, right? I think that's bizarre. So I'm grateful that she's that strong. She walked me in, they checked my temperature, rushed me into ICU, and then I spent the next five days fighting for my life. And I was going down hard. I don't remember her being there at all, Marcus. Uh, we drove one day and I go, you know, it's weird. Like I didn't see you at the hospital for five, six days. And my son in the back seat goes, mom was there all the time. And I'm like, no, she wasn't. She's like, he goes, yeah, she was. And she goes, I got in there every day. They kicked her out of the hospital that night. Wow. That night they walked her out because it was all during, I won't say it because I don't want somebody to red flag your, your podcast, but that thing that went on, right? So there was, there was, it was a nightmare and they, they walked her out 
locked her out of the hotel and said, you can't come or locked her out of the hospital and said, you can't come in. So she's outside. I didn't know any of this. She's outside hysterical thinking she's never going to see me again. She's talking to her best friend, Lizette. And she's like, I'm never going to see my husband again. He's going to die in this hospital. I can't even imagine how that would feel. And it, like it, devastating. And so three days in, they kept trying to push all these drugs on me, these drugs designed for that thing. And I'm like, no, they tested me. I never had it. I have all kinds of x-rays and CT scans of my chest, just pneumonia, right? Really, really bad. But something wasn't right. Well, they started giving me this one drug and I'll say that it was called remdesivir. And the second they gave me that, I started getting worse. Really bad, really bad. And my wife does, she's so smart and she does research on all this stuff. And she comes in one day and like, I'm on oxygen. I can't function. I can't even walk to the bathroom without being out of breath. And I'm every day is getting worse and worse. And she, let me back up a little bit. The day before they gave me that, I woke up at about, I don't, at 12, one, two in the morning, something like that. And it's the only time in my life that I thought I, I really went, I'm going to die. And it's not these kind of like, you know, bro going, oh, it almost killed me. Like I really did. And it's, I can't explain it. It was this weird sense of peace and overwhelming sadness at the same time. I'm, and I thought I was going to die. I want to point out something that that you 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 alluded to, and it's yeah. too important to to hover over. Please, um, most Americans are obese, we're overweight, we're eating horribly, but that was not your case, and no. you went in there fit. You yeah. were you were you were already fit. You were a monster, and and so that's something that I don't I don't want to pass over. Right, you no. were healthy going yeah. in. So, and, and I'll tell you how that plays into this because it's massive. There's a reason why I built the Spartan army. There's a reason why I pushed the Spartan army so hard to people. And I'm like, men, women, primarily men. I'm like, you need to get in here and join the Spartan army. You need to train with me. You need to build your own business. You need to do all this stuff and build the most durable version of yours. Galvanize your life. So you have the money. Like I help, I coach people to build online businesses. I coach people to be super fit and fix their marriages and have great lives and get their mindset right. That's what I do. And all because of what happened to me. Because I know what happened. What would have happened if I if I wouldn't have been like that? I'd be we wouldn't have this. I wouldn't exist. My wife would be a widow. And and I'll explain what I mean because it's it's too important to pass up. So I'm texting her and I go, babe, and I run down all the things that she needs to know about our life. And I'm crying as I'm sending her this. And I'm like, here's every password. And she has them anyway because we don't we don't keep secrets in our marriage. And and it's which is weird that people do that. That's a whole other podcast. And and so. I'm explaining all this to her about like, Hey, I just like, uh, I, I love you. And I, I don't think I'm going to make the morning. And, and I really didn't, I really believe that. And it's the only time and I was 48 at the time. It's the only time in 48 years that I ever thought that. And she sends me a message back. I read the text probably a hundred times a day. It's I screenshot. I keep it on my phone because it's, it was the most incredible thing. And she says, you, you, you can't leave. She says, I, I need you. I can't do this. I can't do this life without you. And Marcus, I got so angry at what was trying to kill me. And I took it out of me and I made it into something standing in front of me. And I said, I'm going to fucking kill you. There's no way I'm not leaving. And that's all I did is I went to war because I'm like, I'm not leaving. I'm not ready. And when I saw that message was so, it was like a switch. And it's like, I felt it. I felt I felt God, I felt my energy, I felt people, I felt my family, I felt everything where my mindset went, I'm not done here yet. And so my wife comes in, they had just started giving me this remdesivir, my wife comes in, she goes, I don't think they're they're helping you. She goes, I, I think they're hurting you. And now we know that's exactly what was happening. But, and I said, I, I don't know. She goes, we need to get out of here. And she goes, I did all this research. And in my notes, I downloaded all my, my files because I know I don't trust them, right? They doctor everything up, screw them all up. And it says, I refuse. I did Google research. My wife is, you know, influencing me and all this stuff. And I'm like, good, keep a record of that because that's the shit that saved my life. And I got up to turn it around for you. Yep. She and so we, saved your life. Yep. She absolutely. There's a hundred percent. God came in and said, you go talk to your husband. You get him out of the hospital. And so when we, and we got out, we checked out. I said, okay, I trust my wife hundred percent. She's like, we need to leave. I said, okay. I, I never, ever, ever will doubt my wife. I don't care what she says. She's my wife. She's my best friend. And, and we're like that. And, and we have the most incredible marriage. It's what everybody wishes they had. And all they have to do is emulate what we do. And they'll have it. 
Like it's that simple, right? So we left the hospital and I'm on oxygen. I could barely walk. I had this tank with me everywhere. We went to like the Olive Garden because I could, I was tired of being in the damn house. And I had an oxygen monitor on me. I had cannula in my nose, but I didn't care. And I, there's so much footage of me working out with an oxygen machine. I'm all skinny, you know? And so for about three weeks, I'm fighting through this going, I know the human body, it gets stronger when you work it. And I just, I would talk to God every day. I'd look at my, my wife and my kids. And that's exactly what I kept thinking is I'm going to do this for you guys. I'm going to do this because you deserve a dad that's here, that's strong, that's savage, that can take a hit. And three weeks into that, I started getting this insane back pain, Marcus. It was to the point where I, I always hesitate to say 10 out of 10, but it was like a 10 out of 10 because it was, I couldn't even breathe. It was like somebody was stabbing, wow. and twisting it in my back and it would come and go. It would last for like an hour and then go away. Well, I finally said, you know, we need to go to, uh, to urgent care, babe. And she's like, she's really worried because she's seen what's transpired, right? She wants and to go back. Yeah. She's like, I don't want to go back there. So we go to urgent care. I tell a little white lie. And I was like, I'll be fine. They're just going to give me some antibiotics. I knew, I knew there was something wrong. And so they take an x-ray and this is in three weeks and they, they take an x-ray and I come around the corner to look at the view box. I've seen tens of thousands of x-rays and the guy goes, the doctor goes, you need to go to ER right now. And I saw it. It was a football sized tumor in my chest all here. It was massive. It was like this big. And and I'm like, holy shit. Okay. And I, I'm like, the ER, the hospital is right across the street. So I, my wife and I go there and she's like, what are they going to do? And I'm like, ah, it's probably just a bunch of pus or something in here. It's, you know, maybe an abscess. I knew full well that's not what it was. You knew better. I did. I did. And I didn't want her to worry, right? She was blanched out, white, terrified. And I, I hate, I hate seeing anyone that I love and care about get upset, right? And so I remember the doctor, I said, so are you going to give me some antibiotics and, and just send me home? And he just puts his hand on me and he says, oh, no, no, no. He says, you need thoracic surgery. Like we have to go in and take this out. You're not going home. And that, when I heard that, I almost threw up because I went, holy shit. I'm not starting off with like getting my knee worked on, right? You know, I, I broke my foot. Like they're going into my chest. Right. And I'm like, this is crazy. Well, it, it, this is when things get really bizarre. So there's a tent outside, two of them filled with people, you know, going through that thing. Hallways are filled with people, patients, right? And I'm in this little ER waiting room now with a glass sliding door. For three days, they're trying to find me a surgeon and a hospital with a bed. Neither one didn't exist. They kept coming in and I was like, I'm getting worse by the hour. I couldn't even leave my bed to walk to the bathroom anymore. I would get so out of breath. They would have to bring me like a you know, basically a bedpan, I'd pee into a jug. I, I right couldn't, there? I, right where uh -huh. you were? Uh-huh. Yeah, because I, I couldn't even walk. I was so, I would get so, I couldn't walk more than five, six feet. I would get out of breath. And it would just be crushing pain in my back. And I was like, basically, I was running on 5% oxygen. And it would, like, this conversation couldn't take place because I would be so out of breath. Wow. My wife would bring me back breakfast every morning and she'd just sit with me. And my wife left on day three. And... And I was like, this is crazy. And they're like, we're still, we're going to have to send you out of state. And right then and there, I knew if they send me out of state, I'm going to die. I won't make that flight. They're going to put me on that plane. I'll die in that plane. And so I thought, Holy is that, shit. is that due to experience? You knew that? or I just knew. Yeah. And I've seen it before when you're at this late in the stage of, of everything going on with your health, when you're that deteriorated, a flight's the last thing you need to be on, you know? Especially like you're in a jet, you're flying to another state. Like I'm in Texas and I'm in the middle of Texas. Everything is a plane flight. It's not a helicopter, right? right. And and so I, she left. She's like, I'm going to go, you know, get the kids ready for school. I was like, okay. And as soon as she left, I just stood there and I just started thanking God. And people screw this up all the time, Marcus. They beg God for things. They beg the universe for things. I'm like, it's never going to work. It's not how it works. So I started thanking God. I said, thank you, God, for, for making me into just this beast of a human being, covering me with muscle, giving me another 50 years with my wife. Thank you for, for giving me the best surgeon in the world to, to fix me. Thank you for guiding his hands. Thank you for the incredible mindset. Thank you for making me just like a fucking superpower. Like I literally was just like for like 10 minutes straight. And I stopped and I sat on the bed and I started to cry. And I was like, that's all I got. 10 minutes later. God, when people say that they don't believe in miracles, I'm like, you're crazy. You're crazy. I am walking proof of nonstop miracles. You told him what you wanted. 
I, it's exactly what I did. I get a knock on the door. I shit you not. This is the craziest thing. I get a knock on the door 10 minutes after I did this. And I the knock, door opens a little bit, sliding door. And I get Trevor Bachmeyer, the guy wasn't even in the room yet. And I go, yeah. He goes, hey, I'm just letting you know that your ride to the hospital tomorrow uh, is going to be here in 30 minutes for your surgery at noon tomorrow. And I'm like, holy shit. I text my wife, get the kids. She's in behind the, the ambulance the whole way to the hospital in Dallas. And I get there. It was still during that time. My kids had to wait in the foyer because they wouldn't even let them in the building. My wife comes up. We get all situated. She comes back down. It was the only night she couldn't stay with me because we had nobody to watch our kids. This was one of these like split decision things, right? So the next day she stayed with me the entire time, slept on this shitty little green like pleather couch in my in my room. But the next day I was supposed to get surgery. I kissed my, right before that, I didn't know if I was ever going to see my wife again. I had no idea. All right. So she's in there right before surgery the next day, 10 o'clock in the morning. And I hand her my phone and I say, no matter what happens, you film everything. And she's like, are you sure? I go, I don't care what it is. You film every damn thing. And she's like, okay. I kiss my wife. I give her everything, ring, everything. Right. Cause you go into surgery, basically a gown and nothing. Right. And they put me out. I wake up. Like, I don't, I remember the, the anesthesiologist saying, you're going to feel a little burning because they put the IV here. He says, you're going to feel a little burning. And that's all I remember. I felt it burn. And then poof, I wake up right in this room, trying to sit up with this big nurse going, this one keeps trying to sit up me. So I'm in the room and I'm, I'm, she has all this on video and I'm just still all, you know, messed up from the anesthesia and a fighter y'all. Absolutely. And, and, but we're, it's in us, it's in us. Like just to pivot real quick, every human being is born fearless and unstoppable. And we learn discipline in the right direction because we all learn how to walk. That requires discipline of, of observation. No parent teaches their kid to walk. None. You learn it by watching. When people go, oh, he taught our son to walk. No, you didn't. Your son taught himself how to walk by watching people do it and going, I refuse to quit. I'm going to do that. And he didn't even know what he was doing or she, if it was a daughter. So that resolve is in every human being. We catch being a sissy, being weak. We catch it from our ecosystem and our landscape around us where people go, no, 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 don't do that. It's too hard. Get out of here. You're born being, you're born to take a load. You're born to carry a cross, man. It's, it's in you. And, and so I'm probably 20, 30 minutes. I didn't know this, but my wife, so I had my wedding ring on, right? And my wife goes, that's the first thing you asked for. I don't even remember. So who you are is exposed in times of adversity and trial, right? A hundred percent. So who I am is the man that goes, give me my wedding ring because I love my wife and it matters. It's the first thing I asked for. And I said to the nurse, I go, okay, you got to get me up. And this little Filipino nurse, I still remember this. Oh, she just irritated me. She goes, no, 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 Trevor, Mr. Buckmeyer, you have to stay here. You, you just had thoracic surgery. You just had thoracic surgery. This, you have to, you, your life's going to be different. You have to adjust. You're not going to be the same anymore. Life's not, it's, you're lucky to be alive. And I said, you can either help me out of this bed or pick me up off the fucking floor. Mm. It's either way, I'm getting out of And I sat up, my wife's got me, all of this, me getting out of the bed, me holding the hand of this other nurse, holding a box, because I'm attached to the wall with these giant vacuum tubes. Like, I had two garden hoses, they were about that big, coming out of my chest. And I have IVs everywhere, oxygen in me, and I'm hooked up to a vacuum hose on the wall, and I got a box to one of these chest tubes, leaking my blood and fluid into it. And I'm carrying that around, all in this video, and I'm holding the IV stand, and I'm hobbling around the room, doing circles. And because I'm like, I'll be damned if I'm going to stay here. This is God, this is right immediately after surgery. Right away. Like I literally opened my eyes. They brought me back to the room. However long that time is, because I really have no concept of how long that was. Right. I, Where's my I, ring? I'm getting up. Give me my ring. Get me out of this bed. Wow. And so just just before that, the surgeon came in. This is the best part. He says, and I. He's like, just letting you know the surgery went okay. You know, went good. Took a little longer. Turned out they nicked my aorta. I pumped out a liter of blood. Like almost all these things that you don't really know were that it could have taken a very bad turn. But, you know, honestly, I think God went, nope, not done with him yet. Fix that. And so my wife is pacing a hole in the concrete waiting because they would text her. 
status on how I'm going, right? That's it's how it's worked. He did surgery on me, Marcus, you know, with a robot. Mm. It was six arms hanging down from the ceiling, looked like a giant Star Trek creation, and he had like a PlayStation 5 controller. Oh my gosh. The craziest thing I've ever seen. And yes, he goes, the nice. surgery went well. He goes, but we had to take your lung. He goes, we got the tumor out, but we also had to take your left lung. And it took a while for that to sink in. And then I realized, holy shit, I'm missing a lung. And believe me, for months, I was very aware. And so I started doing laps around my room. We'll go back up to that point. And I started doing laps around my room. And the second they disconnected me from that wall, I asked, can I walk around the hospital? And they said, yeah, as long as you stay in this area, right? In this recovery, this surgical recovery, right? Intensive care. I said, okay, perfect. So I'm walking around the nurse's station. I, I really don't know, two, 300, 400 feet, maybe tops. So I'm walking around. I do circles around it. The first time I did it, it took me 10, 15, 20 minutes to walk around it. It's not very far, but I get so out of breath. Right. Because I had these tubes coming out of me and I was just, I felt like a bag of crap. Right. But I, by the end of, and I would wipe off, they get so mad at me, Marcus. I'd wipe off their whiteboard. <laughs> There's this huge whiteboard in my room, right? And it has all my like stats and the nurse's name and the doctor's name and the times they did stuff and everything like that. And I'd wipe it all off and I'd write down how many laps and what my <laughs> oxygen sats were, right? And they finally gave up. It was like day three. They went, can you just make sure you write down the oxygen on there too so we know where you're at? I go, perfect. Absolutely. They'd come in and take x-rays of me at least twice a day. I've been so radiated. Holy shit. But every day, at least twice a day, sometimes at night, like my wife would be asleep. It's like two in the morning and this guy would roll in with an x-ray machine, sit up because they're checking to make sure everything's healing, right? And so by the last so i was supposed to be there 14 days to recover i was gone i left in seven they rolled me out of the hospital in a wheelchair with oxygen and a prescription for 12 different medications and they said your life is going to be different you're never going to run you're not going to be physically active anymore you have to remember that and you have to understand you got to take it easy now and i had these giant incisions six of them all on this side right and all over my back like they're all up on my lat and everything it's crazy and I have this giant pad where it's covered where they rip the, I have a, my wife videoed them ripping the hoses out of my chest. Jeez. It's gnarly. It's gnarly. Ooh. And I mean, it's like two feet of hose. And she's like, I hope I can do this without passing out. Right. But it was pretty wild. And so, and it's like, there's me going at the end when she pulled them all out, the nurse was awesome. She pulled them all out. And I go, did you get, did you get one? And she goes, I got both. And I went, Oh, you're, I'm on video. I'm like, oh, you're good. You're badass. <laughs> like, good for you. But it was one of these things where like the longest ride home, it was brutal, you know, and here I am going, I am not going to be a liability for my family. I'm not, I'm not going to do this. I went, okay, God, this is where I'm going to be. All right. I'm going to be the best at this shit then. And I will be the best at this period, I will be the best with one lung. I'll be the best dad, the best CEO, the best father, the best husband. I'll be the best leader. You give me the power to be. I am going to be the fucking best at this. We got home. It was a long stride because every bump hurt. Right. And we got home and my I hugged my, my wife, my kids, my son and my daughter. I mean, I hadn't seen him for almost a month. Right. And I, I, you know, tell him I love him and it was good to be home. And, and my wife goes, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to work out. Really? I've, I've had people go, oh, come on, bullshit. And I go, <laughs> but, but I'm like, it wasn't because I'm like, I want to go work out, bro. That's not why. I'm like, I'm not, I was 153 pounds when I got home. You can look on the videos. I got these big knobby knees and these skinny little shoulders. Like I was, I looked emaciated. You were a shell and, of what you were. Uh, absolutely. And it happened so fast. Like I lost 45, 50 pounds like this. And the doctor said, this is where I was going with this earlier. Doctor said this, he goes, if you wouldn't have been in the physical condition you were when you got you guys listening, have to hear this. It's not if you're skinny or if you're fat, it's if you're either, you need to be covered in muscle. Not, I don't give a shit if you're walking around going, look how jacked I am. You're just a buffoon if you're doing that. You need to be covered in muscle because it allows you to take a hit. And that's what he said. He goes, if you weren't in this condition, you wouldn't have made it. It's a survival. It's, it's, it's our body's natural defense to survive. Biologically designed to be muscular. 
You are not designed to be obese. You're not designed to be weak. You're designed to be strong. It is not abnormal. And yet they ostracize the 1% that are wealthy, strong, and fit. My first workout, when I got home, I couldn't do anything. I had six giant incisions in me. So I hooked up a sled. I got this rogue sled, right? I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, so maybe bleep it out. But I put a 45-pound plate on it, and I put a, a, a long lifting strap on it. It was about 25 feet. And, uh, and I, I just, my driveway is about 400 or so, you know, so I would just do, it's a big circular gravel driveway in front of this house. Right. And, and I said, my wife goes, what do you want? What do you want to do? And I said, I'm going to do laps. Come get me when I collapse. And that's exactly what she did. I don't remember how many, I said, come get me when, when I take a knee, man, come get me when I can't fucking walk anymore. Come get me when I'm done. You, yeah. how, how do you know when you're done? When, when you're you, done. When, you, when you're done. When you're done. When you're that's done. That's the that's the famous Muhammad Ali. That's exactly. It. It's like, hey, the right. workout begins when I start hurting. Yep, that's exactly it. And I I actually just said this to my to my kids. I said, you know, just full transparency, you guys. Like, we make our kids work out even if they're tired. I don't care. Get your ass out there. Why? Because I'm going to burn this habit into you, and we we encourage it and then explain why, right? We're not just like, you're going to work out. We don't care. Like that's just being a dick, but it's like, we give them the reason. So they understand because reasons drive behavior. And my, why my, why is that dark haired fit woman sitting on the love seat over there? That's my, why everything I do in this world is because of her. Like everything. When you were about to quit, you know, she, she uttered the words that you needed to hear is like, yeah. I need you here. You know, most I relationships don't do even this. get to that point. No, let's, let's talk about the will. Let's talk. No, your wife was like, I need you here. And then she I said, can't. you can't leave. I have heard God so many times in my life through my, I've called her my angel. Actually, she started that. So we sat there at lunch, the very first date ever. And she went, I'm, I'm here i'm here to be your angel i'm here to save you she said that to me and i've been calling her my angel since that day 18 years so i'm wedding ring i've been calling her that forever there's so many things to life that people miss because they they're they're arrogant and ignorant and i'm like if you just open up and allow yourself to see what's around and then do look in the mirror this is what people go how how do you get motivated i go motivation is bullshit i'm never motivated ever you're crazy when you're like, well, yeah, but what if they make fun of me? Why do you care? What if it doesn't work? Uh, why do you care? Try it again. Just don't do the same thing, right? right? The third the third one is, you know what? Honestly, but well, there's a whole bunch, but the third one is take risks. Mm. Do what you say. Keep your word, man. Yeah. Number five is be vulnerable to your spouse. Give them all the tools to utterly destroy you, knowing that they're not going to do it. Because then you're not running bandwidth in your brain about what you should or shouldn't say. You can go all in on your spouse. Because most people spend their time going, I don't know if I should say that. What are you doing? Go all in. Why are you with them? Yeah. Exactly. And the number six is never miss. And I get a lot of static for this one. Never miss. Never which means miss. you do it. On my, yeah, which means you do what you said and you finish what you said you were going to do. On my whiteboard out in my gym, it says, never miss. Big purple writing because it's the only pen I had at the time. Never miss. And it says, Brandy, Hope, Pierce, my wife, my daughter, and my son. And I want to quit my workout, Marcus, probably 40, 50 times a workout. I hate it. I'm always in pain. I struggle. I flip upside down. I'm always still aware that I only have one lung. I don't care. They, they said I'd never run again and run a mile a day. And I run a damn fast mile. I train every day. People don't like this. They're like, come on, you're not going to like what I'm going to say. I never miss. I don't train a day. That day that I walked around my driveway, that first day I got home, I've missed a day since. And that was 21 months ago. What was the, I want to ask, what was yeah. the follow-up like after you got released? What did the doctors who looked at you oh. after you got out, what was that like? Two I'm weeks. Like I went to a two-week follow-up and the doctor said, he goes, I've never seen anything like this because mm. I've, been, I've been doing this nine years. I've never seen this because I've never seen anything this fast. And I go, good. And I said, just watch me. Watch everything I fight through. Just watch. 
He's talking about your recovery. Mm-hmm. He's never yeah. seen never seen it. From never seen it this fast ever in his history. He worked chest for a thoracic surgeon. Yeah, I'm they opened your you. chest. What's that? They opened your chest up and you healed. Well, they put they put there were there's six incisions and they basically took everything out of me piece by piece. Gosh, it's the wildest thing because I had to process it when he told me that because I went. Wait, what? I even, I actually on video, I go, did you give me a new one? And he goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how out of it I was, right? Right, right. But I think to myself, the reason people struggle is because like, if people want to get somewhere, you want to have a great life. Number one, don't discount your vision on a weak ass effort that you're about to put out. Level up your effort. There's only two ways you can do things in life. Change your behavior or change your target. If you keep your target where you want it, change your behavior, level up your action. You'll have that life. This book, this is my, I call it GSD, get shit done. Every night I write in this book. I write all the things I'm going to do the next day, everything. And I will not go to bed until this is done. I don't care if it's four in the morning. I get up at the same time every day. And I don't care if people get up at two in the morning or seven. It doesn't matter. Just be consistent. I, I will not end my day until this is done. Because if I do, I'm a liar never miss. And I never do. People go, oh, this guy's ego is going to kill him. That's your problem is you're making up excuses. Why you miss? Why you miss? Don't project your weakness on my strength because it's not going to work. I don't miss. Oh yeah. And then they'll look, right? Haters are always going to look at past failures and they're going to try and find holes in your life. But I'm already looking for holes in my life and plugging them. You'll never be better than me. Never be better at assessing my life as I am. So I look for things and I go, oh, I'm not going to miss that. And that's where people struggle. So the morning I wake up, I look at this. I wake up the same way every morning. My wife is rubbing my back or kissing my shoulder. It's amazing. She's great. And I think of all the things that I'm grateful for. My eyes, my lung, the fact that my wife is next to me, my hands work, my feet work. I'm strong. I'm in a beautiful home with air conditioning and heat. I literally stack wins. And then I get out and I do the same. I do the same thing every day. Then I read this. We get up, I brush my teeth. My, I drink 12 ounces of water. We get in my car. We drive to either Starbucks or Dutch Bros. I get a big ass coffee with a bunch of extra caffeine. We come home. I go out to my gym and I do my morning routine. It's 50 pull-ups. Now it's 51. I added a rep. So 51 pull-ups, um, 102 air squats, 51 push-ups, 102 recliner twists. It was 50, 100, 50, 100. It started way less than that. But now I'm just adding one and two every week. Until I, I can't, I'm just going to keep going. I'm going to just keep pushing the limit. But that's, people go, that's your workout. That's crazy. That's like a workout. I go, it's not a workout. That's me going, I'm alive, man. I, I need your help with something. I need yeah, your help with the, my audience and me to debunk this myth. We commonly hear the yeah. trick is diet, right? It's not exercise, it's diet. Um, but you and your wife actually prove to people all the time that you eat normally. Right, you can yeah. do this. So, so every help, Sunday help. we eat a dozen donuts, dude. <laughs> right, right. So I think I think so. What's the question exactly? Like, is what, it diet? What, is it training? Yeah. Where should we go first for, for that person that is needs to change their life today and make yeah. a difference? Do they focus on diet? Call first me. Or what? Yep. You think I'm not? I'm not kidding. Call me. Look me up on social media. Go to Smashworks and call me. Go to Instagram. Send me a message. Go, hey, Trev. Hey, Spartan. I heard you on, on Gentleman Style. Like, it doesn't matter. I will. I have so many programs. Like, just do this. It's not even complicated. That's where people screw up. So let's it's talk not, about that. Like, how many commandments? How many commandments do we have? Ten. It's not hard. Right? So if you want to go diet versus training, it's both. But here's the struggle. Here's where everybody screws up. Like, and, and this isn't an arrogant statement. Nobody does this better than me because I had to come from the bottom. You know, lots of pretty arrogant statement. There's lots of trainers out there. Did they leave the hospital in a wheelchair missing a damn lung? No, they didn't. Me? I'm jacked and strong as shit. Why? Because I do not quit. And that, I'll just give you the blueprint. I give you what works. I don't have some magic program. I give you what I do. That's where people all oh, let me invent this fancy program. Listen, I grew up on a farm. You know, my, my grandpa did and my dad did. We lifted heavy shit. That's it. It's not complicated. We worked until the sun went down. 
every day. Right? Animals go full throttle. They get up, and a tree will grow to its maximum ability every day. A squirrel will go full throttle all day on purpose. A wolf will go full throttle all day on purpose. A human wakes up and spends 15 hours on their cell phone seeking validation from an approval from people that don't matter. That's crazy. I can't, I can't process that. You want the first thing with training? Change your mindset. Stop seeking approval from people that don't fucking count. Number one. And number two is every day, 60 minutes. Oh, I don't have that kind of time. That's okay. Your illness and your disease and your injury will have lots of time for you later. Mm. Mm. And then look at your diet and go, this is, this is so easy. Listen, the keto, the carnivore, the, the paleo, the vegetarian, all the bullshit out there. Here's what, there is no comp. This isn't complicated. Did God make it? Did it grow out of the ground or fall off a tree or walk on the earth? Knock yourself out. I can give my ratio 45, 25, 30. That's my macro ratio. 45% protein, 25% carbs, 30% fats. How In long fact, do you work out? How long do you work out? Every day? 60 minutes. That's it. Yeah, about an, an hour, sometimes maybe an hour and 15, an hour and 20 if I have, like if I'm doing like a longer run or something, but. And Not I, three I, hours, four hours. No, hell no. And people say, oh, I don't have time to be in the gym. We have kids. We got two. Yeah, but I have a job. We run five companies and we own all five. We could do this all day. Like I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll excuse you if that's where you're looking. That's literally you want to you want to fix everything in your life. Look at your life and go. What is all the dumb shit that I know I'm not to be supposed to be doing? I know it. I know all this extra stuff that I all the options that I give myself. What is all that? Eliminate it now. Eliminate and people go. Oh, you, it's not really that easy. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. You choose. Eliminate everything and only do what you know you should be doing to get to where you want to go. Six months, a year from now, you won't have anybody around you and everybody's going to go, holy shit, how did you get there so fast? You're lucky. No, I eliminated all my options. I go to bed every night, Marcus, and I, and I always say the same thing. It's always the same. Did I outwork yesterday? Did I do what I said I was going to do? And did I eliminate every option? To not do the work. That's it. Do people you have do you what can people I want to touch on your company, Smashworks? Yeah. yeah. What do people need to have before they come see you? Do they need to a get pulse. To a cer- that's it? No a pulse. Wow. A fucking pulse. That's all you need. Cause you say you run a mile. Should I run a mile before I, I reach no. out to you? I got people coming to me who are I have this one guy, Rob, he's a AC guy. I met him in a restaurant. He's 51 and he looked at me and he goes, how old are you? I went 50. He goes, no way. I go, I'm 50. This is what a normal, and I I have no, but, but here's where people go, well, that's not, that's really mean. You know what? Love ain't lies. Love ain't lies, man. So you tell people the truth because people go, oh, you're kind of an asshole when you tell people the truth. Really? Should we unpack that? So if I go, yeah, you're doing great. You go ahead and keep eating, keep getting diabetic, keep screwing up your life. But you know, you're still doing good, Bobby. You're just doing great. Who's the asshole? The one that goes, you're fat. You need me to help you. That's not okay. Or the guy that's like, you're doing great. And you're letting him slide. It's fact, man. Love ain't lies. So this guy, he's like, there's no way. I go, dude, you're a year older than me, man. You should look like this. And he goes, yeah, well, what are you and your wife? Like, you guys are athletes? I go, everybody's an athlete. You're born an athlete. Kids are all athletes. They play all the time. You ever watch kids? They go nuts. <laughs> you are choosing to be that way. As he's eating his pie and his, he's got, like, his drinks in front of him and all this. I go, you don't need all that. What are you doing? So, so you. So- he can't do anything. And I put him through the ringer every day. <laughs> so you don't believe that people genetically are disp- disposed to being better like you're no not, watch. Like, I'll, I'll, help, I'll, I'll give you some great examples this is the best part you're gonna love this my mom fat my dad fat my father-in-law fat my mother-in-law fat my wife beast me beast you have epigenetics is we could get into the whole, you know, we can get into this if you want, but epigenetics is basically how your body changes according to the response or the, the actions that are placed upon it in your environment, right? Like 
what you eat, what you breathe, what you think, how you move, all of that changes your DNA. So I think this, number one, is you are insulting God if you are not the best version of yourself. You are insulting your creator because if we're made in his likeness, he didn't make you to be 350. Mm. He didn't. There's just no way he carried, Jesus carried a cross when he was carrying an extra 200 pounds on himself. No way. So anytime I think about something and I'm like, oh, this is really hard. I go, yeah, is it harder than carrying a cross to my own back? It's not. No. Shut up. Keep going. What I say, don't be a bitch. Keep going. You got nothing. Like when people go like, I even like, I struggle. Sometimes my wife is like, oh boy, that was harsh. And because I do a coach call every Saturday, I do a mindset call with my clients. And every Sunday for my business program, I take these people that have got, they, they've made zero dollars i will start with a blank slate they've never had an online company i'll take them to a million dollars in a year and and i go this you just gotta listen to everything i tell you to do show up to the calls do everything i tell you to do if you miss that's on you don't blame me that's you one of the reasons why i i wanted to have you on the show because you are like david goggins you, i get that all the time you are a sat right the savage mindset beast yeah go hard you know I get thirsty. I'm licking my lips. <laughs> like, yep, that's like, it. I'm I'm going for the end. I'm either yeah. going to outwin you, outpace you, or I'm going to die. Yep. And you go, you take that a part of your life, every di direction, relationships, yep. your marriage, your kids, your family, your businesses. And, and so it sounds to me consistently is this start here. The work starts here. Is that Absolutely. Where, you, where you start? You have to start mindset. there. You have to start there. Your mindset is the controlling factor for everything. If you walk through your day and people go, oh, here's another mindset guru, some tattooed bearded guy telling me how to live my life. I'm not do whatever you want. But if you want the life you keep blabbing about, running your mouth about, and the life that you hate, that you keep running a train on your brain about laying in bed, do something about it. Could you do more? Could you do one more rep? Well, yeah, but it's not how it is anymore. Really? If you weren't fit and could run and jump and be strong and take a hit 5,000 years ago, you got eaten. That's true. You so had to run. Exactly. You know, people say, but it's not like that anymore. I, you have to. My metabolism is, is, my metabolism is low. My, I don't oh, it's such bullshit. I got big bones. I've seen so many x-rays. I've never seen big bones on an x-ray, just so we know. <laughs> never, never. There's no such thing as big bones. It's a, He's like, a doctor, one, big bone. He's a doctor. I'm like, dude, big bone, show me big bones on an x-ray, you dumbass, you're lying. So it's bullshit. But the other part is that I look at, listen, if you want to change, you will change. Most people change. You show me someone who's completely and radically altered their life for the better, and I will show you somebody that has suffered a tragedy. Mm. Because trauma creates memory. If you read about it, you're not going to change it nearly as much as if you feel it and see it. And, and a lot of people don't like that, but it's the truth. I got a test. I kept asking God for this big life, this huge life. I'm going to be hanging out with Ed Milet, David Goggins, like all these people in like three weeks. We're hanging out at Keaton's house, the muscle from, from Diesel Brothers. Like we're just going to sit there and hang out. There's like 50 of us. I would have never been there hanging out with these people had I not changed my mindset about what I do, because now they're like, we need to talk to this guy. He's changing lives. Yeah. Like Alex Mortensen's going to be there. All these people are going to be there because, wow. but I earned my place because I don't quit. And you change your circle. You know what the problem is? People stay hanging out with the other, the same people. These shit buckets that go, oh, we don't want you to win because it makes us feel bad. See, people only see you through two lenses, your position in their life and their position in yours. And if either one of those changes where you start to elevate they're like crabs in a bucket. Nope, I don't like that. Because it makes them look at their own framework of their life and they see the truth and they go, that's right. Listen, people that are losing, losers know they're losing. Winners know they're winning. There's no lie. And the reason people get so angry and triggered, it's kind of, I hate that word, triggered. They get so butthurt about it is because they know they're not doing the work. But they make up all these reasons why they can't. You can always distill it down to the same thing. You're not doing the work. You're missing Find the places in your life where you're missing. Don't miss. Your life will change. It's not that easy, Trevor. Yes, it is. You're complicating it. It's not complicated. I didn't say it was easy. It's just not complicated. 
Create the man or woman you admire. And if you do not admire yourself, don't lie about it. Because you know you're lying because you can't hide from yourself. You know, and they're like, well, but, 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 but nothing. You make the decision. If you want a better life, do the work. If you don't like where you live, move. You're not a tree. Like there's a million things you can go and just validate for the positive. When my buddy, so it's one of my best friends in the world. Um, his name's Andy Elliott. And, and he is literally, he's my, I'm, I'm an only child. He's literally my brother. And he sent me this just the other day. He and I are doing some real epic shit together. But this is what he sent me. <laughs> this is it. Nobody criticizes losers, right? Nobody gets jealous of losers. Remember that next time somebody talks shit about you. I wish I had a better life. Wishing ain't going to get you anywhere. Do the work. Oh, but it's going to take longer. Tomorrow's going to happen whether you like it or not. People join. My programs are all a year. People, could you like a 30-day program? Yeah, no, it's a year. Why? Why is it a year? Because it took me 12 months. I went from a wheelchair to a beast in 12 months. I built a million dollar company with my wife. We did this together from $1,897, from zero basically to a million dollars a month in 12 months. But that's me. My resolve, I guarantee you, is higher than most people's. So when people, but I also didn't have a blueprint. So now I go, you want to start a company? Here's the blueprint. I have people that are working with me that have exited companies for 67. Ryan Moran is a great example. He's done over 30 grand a day. Every day since he started coaching with me, he's been coaching with me for three weeks. Wow. So I tell people, if you have the right blueprint, you win. Right. But all these gurus, that's why I tell people, listen, look at everybody. Look at me. Look at my life. I don't care. Cause I got nothing to hide. That's why I, I, I never miss you. Can, like I am so untouchable and people go, that's really arrogant. No, I'm untouchable with my mindset and my love and my guidance and my value because you could follow me around all day long. I got nothing to hide. Put a camera on me everywhere. You could look through all my history, everything, everything on here, every website, everything, computer everywhere. And you could climb inside my head and see every thought if that was a possibility and there's nothing. I would be ashamed of or want to hide. And my question is always, are you the same? Because most people aren't. Who they are is a representative usually to the world. And then they send themselves later. They usually send their ego into the game and they bench the player. Dude, turn that shit around. Bench your ego. Get out there. Right? right? And, and I think that's where the struggle is, is if you just decide to do something that you want, then you let, you resolve in advance to never give up. And everybody's going to talk you out of it. Your friends are going to come wrapping it all up in concern and love. We just want what's best for you. No, you don't. You want what's best for you. You don't love me unconditionally. You love me on one condition that I don't get better than you because you don't want to get left behind. But God doesn't want you to lose, man. God's on my side. He doesn't want me to lose. When people are like, oh yeah, but you know, is it like God preaches being humble? And, and I go, first of all, where does God preach being humble? Where? You find me the verse in the book where God says that. God rewards hard work. I firmly believe that. I firmly believe if you show up, you do the work, you're true to yourself, you're honest, you're kind, you're loving, you give everything you've got and you, you focus on the outcome you want and you don't, you're not a shit bag. You don't do any bad things. God's going to reward the shit out of you because you did the work, but people convince themselves, right? They placate themselves. Oh, I'm doing the work. Yeah, but you know, you're not, you know, you're not because if the people last rep, go, I'm doing the work. Going. They're not doing that last rep. They're not doing yeah, that. Exactly. I'm doing the work. No, I, mean, I am. No, you're not. Look at your life and find out where you're missing. That's where you're not doing the work. There's somewhere you're missing. That's all. When people go, I don't get it, Trev. I, I'm doing all this stuff you tell me to do. Why is my life not changing? You're missing. No, I'm not. They get really offended. As soon as they get really offended, I know they're missing. Because they're defending their, their position of weakness. I got no defense. I don't care. Because I'm not going to miss. I'll die before I miss. But I don't get another chance. So every time I doubt, I did a workout the other day. Two, two reps, three reps left. It was my last two sets of these squat planes. They were getting progressively heavier. I was miserable, Marcus. I really was like, I'm going to die out here today. And 
I was, it took me so long and I, I wanted to quit for the last probably half hour. And I walked in, my wife was sitting over there. It was one of the few times we trained apart. It was probably three weeks ago. And I came in and she's, she always says the same thing. Hi, my babe. And I looked and she goes, hi, my babe. And I said, hey, baby. And she's, you done? I go, nope, just needed my reason. And I went outside, banged them out like they were nothing. Where you put your head is where you get the results. So when people go, I'm getting a shitty life. Why are you talking about it all the time? Your story, your story, man. It's holding you back. Change your story. Mr. Call Mike. people for help. Yeah. That's where people screw up. They're like, oh, I don't want to pay a coach. Pay the coach. You know the best people in the world? You know what they have? Coaches. Coaches. Mentors, guides. No man is an island, man. No man is an island. How, how can my audience connect with you and get on board with, with what you're doing? How can we find you, sir? Go to, go to Instagram, go to Smashworks, spelled like you see it there on the screen, W-E-R-X. Literally, I get 5,000 DMs a day. I answer everybody. It is not one of my staff. We have a team of people. It is not them. I answer everyone that's important. Tell me. Ask me questions. I'll help you as best as I can because I, I think... People need a place to go that they're like, I'm supported and I'm safe and I know this guy wants me to win. I get so crazy when people win. I love it. I love seeing other people win. Not so. Just all you do. And I'll, it'll be me. I'll be like, let's do it. Let's let's make a plan and then just kill the shit together. Kill it. Kill it, y'all. Connect, connect, connect. Mr. Mr. Big Mark, this is huge. You are phenomenal. You're larger than life. Thanks, man. I thank you, sir. Honored to be here, buddy. This is huge. This is my, I've never done an interview like this, this powerful, this impactful. I hope you all really take to heart everything. The man was at his end. He was at the door. He was, he was done. And he turned it around through sheer willpower and God and his family and his reminder of why he matters why his wife matters why his his baby girl matter his son matters he he was reminded at the door to turn around pay attention and and he he's he's and he's changing lives every single day connect connect let's put it back up on the screen um you can find him smash works facebook That's on instagram too yeah same instagram oh. smash works connect 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 and be and change your life today not tomorrow not next week because just like you said, you're it's you're gonna die. We're, we're all gonna die, but yeah. we can make. You ain't getting out alive, time. man. So you may as well make it count. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you again, brother. I want to say this to you publicly: don't ever quit. No. Don't. We need you. Yeah. There's no quit in me, man. We need you. Yeah. Much love, man. It was so good to be here. Like you're such a good dude, man. This was fun, and and we just got to get noisy about our message. I think that's important because people feel they got nowhere to go. People feel hopeless right now in the world and they need to know, no, you're not. You're not hopeless, man. You just got to find the right people and then take everyone in your circle that doesn't want you to win. You don't have to be nice. Eliminate them. Yes, sir. That's simple. Yeah. Crush it. Crush That's it, it. y'all. Kill it. Thank you, Mr. Trevor. Bye, Thank brother. you all for tuning in to Gentleman Style Podcast. I hope this message was impactful. I hope this was an inspiration. I hope you take your, your game to the next level. Become a Spartan today and fight back. You're, don't give up. You need this. We all need this. Like I always end every show, we got to let Mr. Trevor go. He has five companies to run. He has an incredible family to get back to, and he has to change more lives and impact more lives. So we got to let him go, y'all. But like I end every show, take care of your friends, take care of your family, and always, always take care of business. This is Marcus, your favorite gentleman, and the Spartan, Trevor Backmeyer, signing off. Love you guys. Peace.